Hey guys, hope you're doing well. Today we're going to start a brand new chapter on looking at both consumers and producers at the same time. So the last several, several videos, I've spent a lot of time talking about first the demand side, which is the consumers, then the supply side, which is the producers. Now we're going to try and bring everything together and answer some of the questions that I introduced you to a while back. Now you're going to understand how some of these things we've done in the real world uh, work. So for example, why do gas prices change very often and very, uh, you know, by, they're very volatile. And then similarly, why do price of roses uh, rise significantly, you know, the day or the couple of days before Valentine's Day, but then it goes down after that, right? It's not because of any other reason, but simple demand supply. So now that you've understood, or hopefully, how both demand and supply works, now we can put everything together and analyze how the market behaves when any factor that we've talked about over the last several videos change. Right, so again, this slide you should have seen before. We've analyzed the demand side in, in great detail, which we said that the quantity demanded of a particular good is going to be a function of price, right? So if the price changes, uh, we know the quantity demand is going to change as well. Similarly, it's the supply side is also going to be a function of price, right? If the price changes, the quantity supply changes as well. The difference between the two is that this is a negative correlation. As price goes up, the amount that consumers want to buy goes down and vice versa. And this side, the relationship is going to be positive. Where if the price goes up, producers are going to want to produce more and vice versa. So hopefully you're clear on those links. And if not, go review the last couple of chapters, which will take you some time, and then get back to looking at how the market is going to react when something changes. All right, so now we're going to put everything together and we're going to define what equilibrium is. We're going to look at both equilibrium quantity and equilibrium price and analyze them. This is just a, a funny figure. You know the supply curve is upward sloping. You know the demand curve is downward sloping. We're going to use both of that and look at what uh, equilibrium means. So equilibrium in a, you know, a competitive market refers to a situation where the price has reached a point where quantity supplied and quantity demanded are equal. And I'll do a both a numerical and a graphical example to illustrate that point in just a few slides. All right, so the equilibrium price is going to be the price where the amount of commodity that producers want to produce and the amount of commodity that the consumers want to buy are equalized. That's equilibrium price. And equi equilibrium quantity is that quantity where QS and Q QD are equal. All right, so both of these uh, have very important implication. And then we'll also talk about what happens if we are not in equilibrium, right? If the price is not the equilibrium price and the quantity is not the equilibrium quantity, what does that mean? So graphically, I've already told the answer. The intersection of supply and demand curve will tell us those points, uh, but we'll look at that in more detail in just a second. So first, let's look at a, a numerical example. So if the QD, let me just pick an equation. If QD is 200 minus P, Right, so you've seen equations like this before, uh, but you know, make sure you are comfortable working with these equations. And QS is 120 plus P. So you can see that quantity supplied is positively correlated with price and quantity demanded is negatively correlated with price. So now we're gonna put both of them together and see how, the, how to get to the equilibrium quantity. So now, you know, we know that if price is more than 200, nobody's going to buy anything, right? So those, uh, those uh, endpoints you should remember when we looked at the demand side. So equilibrium quantity is a quantity where QD and QS are equalized. So to figure out if you're given two equations, solve it in terms of quantities, QD and QS, and then equate the two together. So let's do that here. To equate the two together, we say 200 minus P equalizes 120 plus P. So if this is true, that means we are in equilibrium. So just solve for the equation, you take 120 on this side, it becomes 80 equals, you take 2p to the other side, 2p, and therefore p equals 40. So equilibrium price in this example is going to be 40. And then you can take that price and put it back into either of the two equations and you'll get the same number. If we put price here, you get 200 minus p, so qd is going to be 160. Or if you take the same price, 40, and put it into this equation, you'll get 120 plus 40, which is also 160. So you observe, that equilibrium quantity is where we've reached a price where the QD, where QD and QS are identical. Right, so make sure you're able to work with this uh, numerically. Now let's look at it graphically. So here we have a graph. You should know this is the demand curve. This is the supply curve. You should know on the x-axis we are representing quantity. And on the vertical axis we are representing price. So if we are in equilibrium, we've looked at supply curve by itself. We looked at the demand curve by itself. Now we're putting everything together. If we are in equilibrium, which is this point, 
What that means is this price, in our example, it was 40. And this quantity, which in our example was 160, is going to be the equilibrium price and quantity. All right, so make sure you're able to understand it graphically as well, because at that price, we are hitting the supply curve at the same quantity, and we're also hitting the demand curve on the same quantity. So QS and QD are identical at that quantity. All right, so hopefully you understand that, and we'll do some examples uh, with graphs as well. All right, so let's look at a scenario, a couple of scenarios where the price is not at equilibrium price, and then we'll see how your things change if we are not there. So let's look at excess supply. Excess supply happens if the price is more than the equilibrium price. So we know this is the equilibrium price. If the price happens to be above equilibrium price, in this case 50 cents more, now we know that there are going to be more producers that want to sell the good. So QS is going to be 10 and QD is going to be only 4. So we are not in equilibrium, right? Because at $2, QS and QD are both 7. So you, you should know that if the price is $2, both QS and QD are going to be 7. QS equals QD equals 7. But we are not at $2. So if the price is not $2, we now have more people or producers that want to sell than there are consumers who want to buy. So think about if this is a competitive market, and therefore we call it a surplus, which is because there are more things being produced than being bought. So if this is a competitive market, what do you think will happen? Do you think the surplus will exist forever or will it, you know, will it get eradicated by the market forces? And the answer it is, think about if the price is 250, right? The producer selling 10 units, there are only four people buying. So if you're a producer, you realize that if I charge 250, I'm going to have six units that are going to be sitting around, nobody's going to be buying. So in order to sell those six units, they have to lower price. And as the lower price, there are more people who are going to start buying it and you eventually will get to equilibrium. So nobody has to sell the sellers, right? Nobody has to tell the producers that, you know, lower price. They automatically realize it on their own because they know if they charge 250, there are going to be six units that nobody's buying. So they automatically have an incentive to lower the price so that they can now sell more units and eventually get to equilibrium. Now let's look at the other scenario, which is what happens if there is a shortage so now that means again shortage means excess demand if that's a supply curve that's a demand curve again the equilibrium is the same now if the price is below equilibrium price now what you see is there are more people who want to buy the good because that's where we hit the demand curve right the demand curve tells you how many people want to buy the good at a given price and there are only going to be four producers who want to sell the good so now what you observe and therefore there's going to be a shortage of six units so now what you observe is producers if you're a producer you realize if you're charging 150, you're producing four units, and there are 10 people who want to buy your good. So you, you know, if there are more people waiting in line than what you have to sell, what you can do without anyone telling you is raise prices. So you raise prices until you get to equilibrium and there is no shortage. So there are situations in the real world where you know, certain policies by the government prevent producers or, and consumers to get to equilibrium. But if there are no such policies, if there's a shortage or there's a surplus, the competitive market will always, will always get to equilibrium unless there's something preventing them from. We haven't looked at that. We'll look at a couple of examples later in this chapter. But the point here is that everyone likes this. Consumers and producers both, that's where they want to get at. But if the price is below or above, you should understand how market forces, the, you know, the invisible hand, which is the prices, nobody has to tell me what to pay. Nobody has to tell me how much to sell at. I, based on my own incentives, I is going to make sure that I get there. So that's the, the beauty of the you know, uh, perfect competition and competitive market is that we reach equilibrium on our own. We don't have to, nobody has to tell us that we, you, know, you should be getting there. All right, so in this video, we talked about putting everything together. We looked at the demand side, the supply side, and looked at an example where you analyze the graph on the same graph, which is unlike what we've done when we talked about the consumers and when we talked about the producers separately. So in the next video, I'll do a little bit more detailed example of how we analyze shifts in demand supply. You should know what causes them to shift from before, but now we look at both of them together and do a detailed graphical example. So make sure you understand these concepts and I'll do an example in the next video.